Hello there everyone and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we start unit 7 of AP Psychology. Throughout this unit we are going to be going over motivation, our emotions, and personality. Today we start off with unit 7 topic 1, theories of motivation. Motivation is our need or desire that is directed towards a specific goal. People read books, listen to podcasts, watch shows, all to learn about how to stay motivated. Many people have used different strategies and life hacks to try and improve their motivation, with some seen success and others not so much. In life we all have different drives. These are things that motivate us to take action. We can see that we have primary needs and secondary needs. Primary needs are things that are biological. For example, if you're hungry or thirsty. Secondary needs are psychological. Think of social approval or a sense of belonging. Now to start this video out, we're going to be looking at different theories of motivation. Our first theory dates back to the early roots of psychology with William James. This theory is the instinct theory. This theory believes that motivation is something you are born with. It's not external items or things that provide motivation motivation to an individual. Rather, it's their instincts, behaviors and traits that they're born with and do not have to learn. Essentially, motivation here is connected to genetics. It's not something you can learn. You're born with it. James had some ideas of what he thought were instincts, such as a mother protecting their baby. Another theory is the drive reduction theory. This theory believes that we are always trying to keep our bodies in homeostasis. Remember back to some of our previous units. Homeostasis is the ability of the body to maintain internal stability. For example, if you're in a hot room, you'll start to overheat heat and you'll become motivated to change to cooler clothes in order to find a way to reduce your heat. Here your motivation is focused on your primary needs. Essentially what this theory is saying is that we have something that occurs in life that takes our body out of homeostasis. For example, you might be thirsty or hungry, just to give a few examples. This causes you to need a drink or eat food. This motivation stems from your hunger and thirst drive. A drive, remember, occurs when we're in a state of tension or imbalance. These two drives are satisfied by you getting motivated to eat food or drink water. This this reduces the imbalance and returns your body to homeostasis, which reduces your drive and motivation to eat or drink. There is also the arousal theory, which looks at a person's arousal level and their performance. This theory is based on the yerksey dotson law, which is the principle that performance increases with arousal, but only up to a certain point. If an individual goes beyond that point, their performance starts to decrease. For example, let's say you are taking a test in class. When you are studying for the test and even taking it, you'll do better if you have some nerves. This keeps you interested and focus on the task at hand. Now, if you're too nervous and you're shaking with fear, your performance on the test will surely be poor since you weren't able to concentrate. On the other hand, if you have no nerves at all and couldn't care less about the test, you may also do bad since you won't be motivated to focus on preparing for the test or focus during it. We can see that each person has a sweet spot where arousal motivates them to perform well at whatever they're doing. Anything under that spot or above it will cause the individual to see a decrease in motivation and performance. You can see this graphically here. Here. On the y-axis we have our performance level and on the x-axis is our arousal level. Notice that if we compare difficult tasks and easy tasks, it takes less arousal to do better on difficult tasks. To understand why this can occur, think about an easy class you have. I know for me it was an anthropology class I took in college. The professor did not really care if you were in class or not and the lecture was straight from the book. The class overall was not that challenging and I ended up getting bored. I ended up actually struggling on a couple of tasks because my motivation for the class was so low since it didn't pique my interest due to the easy nature of the course. So I made simple mistakes because I wasn't able to be motivated for the class. On the other hand, this theory can also explain why when someone is over aroused or stressed, they stop or give up. For example, if students are taking a class that is too difficult for them, they might start skipping the class or refusing to do the work since they're over aroused and are seeking to try and reduce their arousal. We can see this when looking at the graph. When arousal is high, performance actually decreases. Now one theory that incorporates primary needs and secondary needs is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This was created by Abraham Maslow, and this theory seeks to explain how individuals are motivated based on their current level state. The first part of Maslow's theory is the physiological needs of an individual, things like food, water, clothing, and shelter, and so on. These are basic needs that need to be satisfied first. Maslow visualized this theory as a pyramid. You can't move up the pyramid without developing your base. Once an individual achieved their physiological needs, they would then move up to the next level, which was their safety needs. Individuals need to be motivated to find a secure 
secure job, home, and to have their life set up in a manner that provides security and a sense of safety. From there, individuals move into love and belonging. Here, they're motivated to develop friendships with their friends and family. Intimacy is important, and there's a desire to build a sense of belonging. If an individual does not have the first two levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they'll not seek companionship, and will instead focus on fulfilling those first two levels. This is why, especially for children who are developing, it's important for them to have access to resources that fulfill their physiological needs and a safe place to call their own. Once an individual has satisfied the first three levels, the individual then moves into their esteem needs. Here, individuals develop self-esteem, respect, and independence from others. This allows them to develop agency and competence. After that, individuals move into self-actualization. This is when individuals has a desire to achieve and they seek answers to larger questions. They're motivated to understand their own identity and the world around them. Individuals here are motivated to achieve more. Concepts such as morality, creativity, problem-solving ability all start to become fine-tuned during this stage as individuals continue to grow intellectually. We can see that Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows us that we need to obtain the basic needs first before we can move up to the higher levels. This theory could be used to explain one of the reasons that students who come from families with more money and stability and a safe home life tend to perform better in school. If students are still trying to get the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs fulfilled, it'll be difficult for them to be motivated on school. They need to focus on their basic needs first before they focus on expanding their knowledge base. Now another theory that I want to touch on is cognitive dissonance theory. This theory is actually similar to some of the other theories we've talked about because it believes that our body's trying to keep us balanced. This theory proposes that our bodies have a cognitive system that needs to stay constant. And when something happens that is not in line with our mind's consistency, we go into a physiological state that'll motivate us to fix the inconsistency. An example of this would be if you believe that eating animals was just wrong, but you still ate hamburgers. When you ate a hamburger, it'd make you feel uncomfortable, and that uncomfortable feeling would motivate you to change your behavior. Now, changing gears, we can also see the power of incentives when it comes to motivation. Incentives are positive or negative external stimuli that seek to promote a particular behavior. We talked about positive and negative reinforcement in our Unit 4 already, and how one can utilize rewards to promote or reduce certain types of behavior. But I want to just quickly highlight the power of incentives. The incentive theory states that we are motivated by incentives to act or behave in a particular way. For example, I would bet that one of the reasons why some of you are watching this video right now is because of incentives. Many of you are probably watching this video to get a better grade in your class or to make sure you do well on the AP exam in May. Your incentive is your GPA or possibly earning college credit. Understanding incentives can be really important, especially if you're in the world of business. Incentives are a great way to motivate employees to not only improve their productivity, but also quality. Plus, when they're used correctly, they can make a better work environment. For example, when I worked at the Mall of America as a shift manager for the theme park, we would use incentives to get employees to come in and pick up shifts during busy times. The mall would provide pay bonuses, provide lunch for employees, and enter names into raffles as people picked up more shifts. This allowed us to increase our productivity and a positive work environment during busy times when we needed employees to continue to work hard during the day. Now, traditionally, incentives are extrinsic motivating forces, meaning they are outside factors that motivate individuals. These can be effective in the short run, but they're not as long lasting as intrinsic motivation. This is when an individual is motivated by internal forces. For example, the pay bonuses in my last example of the Mall of America were a great example of an extrinsic reward that motivated workers extrinsically. But employees who want to come in and help out and want to do a good job because they found value in that, that's an intrinsic motivation. And that's a lot longer lasting. One other example of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation can be school. Students who are only taking a class for a grade will have a harder time enjoying the class and may not learn as much since they're just going to be focusing on the extrinsic reward, which is the grade. While students who are taking a class because they're interested in the material and want to learn are more intrinsically motivated and will get more out of the class. When extrinsic rewards are the main driver for an individual, an individual may experience the over-justification effect, which is when the external incentives decrease a person's intrinsic motivations. This will lead the individual to most likely stop performing a task or decrease how often they perform the task once the external incentives decrease or stop. So as we can see, motivation can take different forms. Sometimes motivation can come from a place that has nothing to do with our survival or biological needs. Henry Murray looked at motivation and found that sometimes an individual has motivation to push for a mastery of a subject and will continue to achieve more significant accomplishments even when they've already been successful. This is known as the achievement motivation. This is one of the reasons why actors who have already accomplished fame and wealth continue to take on harder and harder roles, or why tech innovators who have already 
already made plenty of money with innovations they've already created, continue to push the bounds of technology. All right, now I know we've already talked about a lot of concepts in this video, but we have a couple more concepts that we need to go into before we wrap everything up. Also, if you're finding value in this video, consider subscribing. It's a great way to support the channel and it'll make sure you don't miss out on future topic review videos. Now, one other concept with motivation that you'll wanna have an understanding of is self-efficacy. Albert Bandura defines self-efficacy as an individual's belief in their own ability to exercise control over their own lives. The higher a person's self-efficacy is in a specific task, the more confident an individual is in performing that task. Bandura believed that there were four different factors that determined an individual self-efficacy. The first being your past experiences. For example, if you completed a similar task in the past, you would be less intimidated by future tasks that were similar. Next is vicarious experience. This is when you observe someone else performing a task and you see them succeed or fail. For example, have you ever watched a game show and thought, oh, that looks so easy, I could do that. Or maybe you watched a different individual fail at a particular task and now you think that task might be pretty hard. Another aspect of self-efficacy is social persuasion. We can see that when other individuals give you encouragement and support, you'll develop a higher self-efficacy for the task at hand. But if others are continuously saying you can't do that or that task is too difficult, the opposite will happen. Lastly, there is the physiological feedback. This is how your body reacts to the task you're trying to perform. For example, if you have to give a class presentation and you start to feel butterflies in your stomach and your heart starts racing, you might perceive that as you are excited to present, which would increase your self-efficacy. Or you might perceive that as you are terrified and you're going to throw up, which would decrease your self-efficacy. Now, I do want to stress that self-efficacy is different from a person's self-esteem. Self-efficacy is all about an individual's belief in their ability to perform certain tasks, while self-esteem is the respect one has for themselves. For example, me saying that I know I'm a good person would be an example of me having a high self-esteem, but not self-efficacy. Saying that I know I'll get an A on my next psychology test, that would be an example of me having high self-efficacy. All right, that's it for this video. Now you know the drill. If you found value in this video, hit that subscribe button down below. And don't forget to answer the review questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section down below as well. In our next video, we are gonna be continuing our conversation with motivation and we'll look at different drivers that motivate us. Also, if you need more help with your studies in AP Psychology, make sure to check out my Ultimate Review Packet. It's a great resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on the national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.